In the early 1990s, the world witnessed a very strange scientific experiment called Biosphere 2. Eight men dressed in futuristic uniforms waved to a huge crowd of journalists and entered a hermetic airlock located in the Arizona desert. But before you start watching, I'm going to ask you to subscribe. I've noticed that more than half of the people who watch my channel on a regular basis aren't subscribed to my channel. Do that right now, subscribe and turn on the notifications. Thank you. The airtight glass domes housed five landscape modules, jungle, savanna, swamp, desert, and even a small ocean with a beach and coral reef. In the midst of this beauty was an agricultural unit, equipped with the latest technology, as well as an avant-garde-style apartment building. In addition to people, some 4,000 diverse fauna were also brought inside, including goats, pigs, and chickens on the farm. The whole ark was to exist autonomously for two years, feeding on what grew under the dome, breathing the oxygen released by the plants, purifying and endlessly using the same water. It was a miniature planet, untouched by the technological revolution, where eight intelligent, enlightened people planned to do simple physical labor, to gather around the same dinner table, to play music in their leisure hours, and finally to work for the great cause, for the good of science. Isn't that paradise? As it turned out, it wasn't that simple. At first it was exactly as they dreamed. The colonists worked enthusiastically in the fields of the farm, checking the operation of all the systems, watching the wildlife of the jungle, fishing, sitting on their little beach, and at night eating a beautifully prepared dinner of the freshest produce on the balcony overlooking the ripening crops. Beyond the green beds and the glass wall of the farm was the desert and the mountain range behind which the sun was setting. The colonists nicknamed this balcony the Visionary Café, the future seemed especially bright from here. After supper, there were philosophical discussions or impromptu jam sessions. Many brought their own musical instruments, and although there were no professional musicians among them, what came out seemed to be the avant-garde music of the future in a wave of general enthusiasm. About a week later, Van Tillo, Biosphere's chief technician, came in for breakfast very excited. He announced that he had strange and unpleasant news. Daily measurements of air conditions showed that the designers of the dome had miscalculated. The amount of oxygen in the atmosphere is gradually decreasing and the percentage of carbon dioxide is increasing. So far it is completely unnoticeable, but if the trend continues, in about a year it will become impossible to exist on the station. From that day on, the paradise life of the Bionauts ended, and the intense struggle for the air they breathed began. First, it was decided to build up green biomass as intensively as possible. The colonists devoted all their free time to planting and caring for the plants. Second, they turned on the reserve carbon dioxide absorber, from which sediment had to be scraped off constantly. Third, an unexpected helper was the ocean, where some CO2 was deposited, turning into acetic acid. However, the acidity of the ocean was constantly increasing, and we had to use additives to lower it. Nothing worked. The air beneath the dome became increasingly thin. Soon the Bionauts were faced with another global problem. It turned out that a 20-hectare farm could provide only 80% of the colonists' food needs with all modern cultivation techniques. Their daily ration, the same for women and men, was 1,700 calories, normal for a sedentary office life, but disastrously low for the amount of physical work that each inhabitant of the biosphere had to do. At first dinner was served as a buffet, but soon serious conflicts began to arise over this, and the food was poured onto everyone's plate, measuring out literally by the gram. People got up from the table hungry and constantly dreamed of the delicacies of the big world. Evening philosophical discussions replaced fantasies about what they would eat when they got out. The pantry, where bananas, the main delicacy of the Bionauts, were kept, had to be locked after a disgusting episode of anonymous looting. Before giving the purges to the pigs, people carefully picked out anything they could eat themselves. Banana skins and nut husks went for delicacy. One evening Jane Pointer, in charge of the farm, confessed that she was aware of a future food crisis. A few months before the settlement she had calculated that the Bionauts would be short of food, but under the influence of Dr. Walford and his ideas about a healthy diet, it was decided that the shortage would only benefit them. The doctor, by the way, was the only one who did not complain about hunger. He continued to insist on the validity of his theory, 
Already after six months of the starvation diet, the Bionauts' blood condition improved significantly, their cholesterol level dropped, and their metabolism improved. People had lost 10 to 18 percent of their body weight and looked remarkably young. They smiled from behind the glass at journalists and curious tourists, pretending that nothing was going on. However, the Bionauts felt worse and worse. The summer of 1992 was particularly difficult for the colonists. The rice crops had been destroyed by pests, so for months their diet consisted almost entirely of beans, yams, and carrots. An excess of beta-carotene caused their skin to turn orange. Adding to this misfortune was a particularly strong El Nino, which caused the sky over Biosphere 2 to be covered in clouds for most of the winter. This weakened the jungle's photosynthesis, hence the production of precious oxygen, and reduced the already meager crops. The world around them was losing its beauty and harmony. In the desert because of condensation on the ceiling, it rained regularly so that many plants rotted away. Huge five-meter-tall trees in the jungle suddenly became brittle, some fell, breaking everything around them. Later, when scientists investigated this phenomenon, they concluded that it was caused by the lack of wind under the canopy, which strengthens the trunks of trees in nature. The drains in the fish ponds were clogged, and there were fewer and fewer fish. The acidity of the ocean, which was killing corals, was becoming more and more difficult to control. The animal life of the jungle and savanna also dwindled inexorably. Only cockroaches and ants, which filled all biological niches, were doing fine. The biosphere was gradually dying. The hosts of paradise felt no better. The amount of oxygen in the atmosphere was constantly decreasing and reached 16%, the norm being 20%. This is comparable to the thin air in the mountains, and usually the human body quickly adapts to this condition. However, due to the general exhaustion of the colonists, the mountain sickness did not let them go. The Bionauts became quickly tired, constantly dizzy, and could no longer perform the same amount of work as before. But in the most radical way oxygen deprivation affected their morale. Everyone felt depressed, sad, and irritable. Every day there were scandals under the dome. The main reason for the conflict was that Alan did not allow the Bionauts to make their problems public. He continued to pretend that the experiment was going according to plan. Half of the colonists, the two captains, the PR director, and the chief of research, that is, the management, were in complete agreement with this position. They believed it was necessary to stay under the dome for the plan two years at all costs. For other Bionauts argued that it was urgent to request help from international scientists to understand why the oxygen was disappearing. It would also be a good idea to order some air and food from the outside. Jane Pointer, leader of the group that wanted to ask for help, describes the beginning of the conflict as follows, I was cleaning the animal pens at the farm. My head was terribly dizzy, and I had to rest minute by minute. In the morning we were talking about our situation, and I said that staying here and suffocating was some kind of sectarianism. I thought about it all, then I turned around and saw Abigail standing behind me. She had something in her mouth. The next second she was spitting in my face. I was confused and asked, why? Figure it out for yourself, she replied, turning around and walking away. Meanwhile, the regular spectators, who came in busloads every day to see what was going on in the giant human aquarium, had no idea what was going on there. They lined the wall, sipping cokes and munching hot dogs, and the people in futuristic suits behind the glass seemed to them remarkably spiritual, real characters from science fiction books and visionaries. By and large, though, the visionaries were simply very tired and hungry. In the fall of 1992, the oxygen content under the dome dropped to 14 percent. Dr. Walford announced that he was relinquishing his duties because he was no longer able to add up even two-digit numbers in his mind. At night, the Bionauts constantly woke up as active plant photosynthesis ceased, oxygen levels plummeted and they began to suffocate. By this point, all the vertebrate animals of the biosphere had died. A year after the experiment began, Allen and Bass decided to depressurize the capsule and add oxygen to the biosphere's atmosphere. They also allowed the Bionauts to use untouched supplies of grain and vegetables from the seed vault. This greatly improved the overall condition of the colonists. 
However, the two warring groups remained in a state of permanent war, trying not even to talk to each other. On September 26, 1993, when the airlock was ceremonially depressurized and the people emerged, one could tell from their faces that the experiment had failed, the expulsion from paradise had taken place fully and forever. The biosphere proved to be uninhabitable. Meanwhile, journalists, who learned of the addition of oxygen to the atmosphere, made a huge scandal out of it and dubbed the biosphere the grand failure of the century. So what was this mysterious oxygen problem? When scientists carefully examined the deplorable condition of the ruined domes, they concluded that the fatal role was played by the cement ceilings. The oxygen reacted with the cement and was deposited as oxides on the walls. Bacteria in the soil were another active consumer of oxygen. The most fertile Chernozem was chosen for the biosphere, so that the natural trace elements it contained could last for many years, but this soil was very rich in microorganisms that breathed oxygen in exactly the same way as vertebrates do. Scientific journals have recognized these discoveries as the main and only achievements of the biosphere. On one of the inner walls of the planet there are still a few lines written by one of the women, only here we felt how dependent we are on nature. If there are no trees, we will have nothing to breathe, if the water is polluted, we will have nothing to drink. BIOS 3, Soviet Biosphere At the time of the Soviet Union, in Krasnoyarsk Akadim Gorodok there was created an analog of the American Biosphere 2, a complex, BIOS 3, modeling a closed ecosystem, which proved to be more successful. Of course, it was much smaller in scale than its American counterpart. Recall that Biosphere 2 was a complex of seven greenhouse biomes, tropical forest, savanna, desert, etc., isolated from the environment, a total area of 1.5 hectares. These isolated biomes were inhabited by 300 species of organisms, not counting Homo sapiens and numerous species of bacteria living in the soil. The creators of this ambitious replica of the biosphere apparently poorly studied the biology and physiology of all the organisms placed in Biosphere 2 as people living in this enclosed environment began to feel a lack of oxygen. As a result, oxygen had to be pumped up. In the Soviet biosphere BIOS-3 managed to more fully achieve the closed cycle of substances by water and gases. The construction of BIOS-3 was completed back in 1972. The area of the pressurized room was 315 square meters. It consisted of four compartments. The first compartment, domestic. The crew of three people lived there. The second compartment, algae compartment. There were chlorella cultivators, their main function was to convert CO2 into O2. Three compartment, phytotron with a variety of dwarf wheat with shortened stems, to reduce the amount of waste. Wheat was grown by conveyor method, 14 ages of wheat were present in the phytotron at one time. Bread was baked from the wheat and served to the test subjects. Each colonist had about 200 grams of grain. Compartment 4, Phytotron with Vegetables, Conveyor Belt of Six Ages. This phytotron grew carrots, radishes, beets, potatoes, cabbage, cucumbers, sorrel, lettuce, dill, onions, and chufa to produce vegetable oil. As a result, there were about 400 grams of fresh vegetables for each experimental colonist. Human waste products were mineralized and partially fed into the cultivators with chlorella. Domestic wastewater from washing and laundry went to irrigate the wheat and vegetables. The condensate generated in the phytotrons and cultivators was used as drinking water. This water was first passed through filters containing ion exchange resins and activated carbon. Under such conditions, one of the test subjects, engineer Nikolai Bugreev, managed to live for 13 months. As a result of the technologies used, the creators of BIOS 3 managed to close the gas and water cycle by almost 100%. The situation with food was worse. About 40% of food, first of all, animal products, were obtained by the experimental subjects from previously stored canned food. The Soviet Union collapsed and work on the BIOS 3 project was suspended. However, work on this closed biosystem was resumed in 2005. If you go to the official website of the new International Center for Closed Ecosystems, you can see the latest report, dated 2010. According to the scant information contained in that report, 
2010 was a preparatory stage for further international research on closed ecosystems with both European and Chinese partners. It would be interesting to learn about the fate of this project. I would like to believe that the rich experience accumulated by Soviet science will not go in vain. Especially since, in view of recent statements about intentions to colonize Mars, the scientific field dealing with the study of closed ecosystems is becoming more and more relevant. I thank you for watching. Your support is very important to me. Your comments and thumbs up motivate me to release new videos on interesting topics. Subscribe and turn on notifications. See you in the new videos.